Welcome everyone at home and here in the library. We are going to be continuing a series tonight called Wild Maine, which is in partnership with the Center for Wildlife Studies. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Jack Hopkins, the president of the Center for Wildlife Studies. He'll tell you a little bit about the organization and introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Julia. Um, before I introduce Matt, <clears throat> like to just to tell you a little bit about the Center for Wildlife Studies. So we're a Maine-based 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we work all over the world. We offer specialized training opportunities to ecologists, conservation biologists, environmental scientists, folks all over the world. Um, we also do research here at home as well as globally. Um, we've got faculty and we've got these instructors that, that train um, the future generation of, of these leaders. Um, and that's really our focus. We believe that putting our putting our effort, time, and money into developing our leaders throughout the world is a really good place to to promote our conservation. Um, today, we're continuing this community education program that we started last year that we're super psyched about in partnership here with the Camden Public Library. Um, it's called Wild Maine, and really the purpose of this program is just to educate you all, both residents and visitors alike to educate you all about our amazing natural resources here in Maine. And to do that, we bring in the experts, right? We bring in the people who really know their stuff, okay? Um, and, and without further ado, I'd like to present Matt Chatfield, who really does know his stuff, okay? <laughs> this guy is assistant professor at the University of Maine. He's a conservation biologist, herpetologist, good friend of mine, colleague at Unity College back in the day. Um, and he, uh, I mean, bottom line is, is this guy knows reptiles and amphibians, right? Like, you know, uh, especially, especially here in Maine, okay? I mean, he, he actually has wrestled uh, uh, alligators. <laughs> no, but really this, we are really, um, we're, we're super pumped to have Matt here tonight. He's gonna talk about one of our iconic species of Maine, right? The wood turtle. I am super psyched. Um, to introduce Matt. I'm super psyched that he's going to be talking about this really cool species that I get the chance to work on now and is one of my favorite species. So uh, with that, Matt, take it away. Great. Thank you, ben. So thank you everybody for coming out tonight and, and thank you everybody for, for joining us on Zoom as well. Um, and also thanks to the Camden Public Library for hosting us and for Center for Wildlife Studies. Um, it's an honor to be part of um, to be part of your mission. So, as as Jack mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, about Maine wood turtles, and really the 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 um, the premise is the natural history of of wood turtles. But mostly, what I want to tell you about is the Maine Wood Turtle Project, which is a series of studies that colleagues and I started um, about seven years ago now, and it has since grown and involves many students, many collaborators, partners. Um, and it's really going in some exciting directions. So that that's that's going to be the focus of, of tonight. Get rid of that thing that says close captioning. <laughs> okay. okay, so I'm going to start though with a by, I'm going to start by prefacing this talk um, with some context and 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 um uh, providing some sort of background to understanding the Maine Wood Turtle Project. And I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about, about the plight of turtles sort of worldwide. So as you may or may not know, turtles as a group um, are really not doing well. In fact, they're among the most endangered of all vertebrate groups on Earth. And using data provided by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is sort of like the, the global group that's responsible for, for keeping a list of all the species in the world that are the most dangered, uh, endangered, I'm using that IUCN data, um, we learned that about one in five turtles is listed as critically endangered. That means that they're on the brink of extinction. And just over a third are critically endangered or endangered. Just over half are critically endangered, endangered or threatened. And if we infer um, or extrapolate to those animals for which we simply don't have very much information, that number rises to even a scarier level of about 56%. And these numbers are a few years old. In fact, if we look at some other less formal um, uh, uh, numbers, uh, numbers that were published in the last year or two, this number by some estimates is over 60%. 
So if we think about that, about two out of every three species of turtles on Earth are declining in the wild and are vulnerable to extinction. This is, this is appalling. Turtles as a group are not doing well. Yeah, <laughs> I'll let you do your magic. Okay. okay. There we go. <clears throat> um, so wood turtles um, as, as a species is, is, as Jack mentioned, an iconic sort of name or Northwood species. Uh, the scientific name, Gleptemis insculpta, that, that specific epithet insculpta, refers to the, the, um, uh, the sculpted look or the um, sort of a pattern and texture on top of the shell. It's the carapace, the top part of the, the turtle shell. Um, and it really is a charismatic animal. And there's many interesting things and reasons to study wood turtles aside from their conservation flight. Ecologically, they're interesting. Their natural history is unusual, which I'll talk about in just a moment. They're known for their intelligence. Um, it's a really interesting species for, for lots of reasons, not just from a conservation perspective. Picture here is a, a distribution map. So this is a species that's restricted to Northern latitude. It's one of the few reptiles that's found in the North and only in the North. Um, the northern Midwest and across the, the northeastern United States and the maritime provinces of Canada. One of the many interesting things about wood turtles is this ecological life history pattern that they have where they, they migrate seasonally from their aquatic overwintering habitats and medium and large medium to large streams into their summer upland foraging grounds well away from the river, sometimes hundreds of meters. So they migrate seasonally back and forth from the water into the uplands back to the water. That's unusual, not unique, but unusual amongst turtle species. And I mentioned before that turtles as a, as a whole aren't doing well, and the wood turtles are not exempt from this. In fact, we know now from a handful of studies that they are declining throughout their range. They are, in point of fact, listed as endangered on that IUCN red list that I mentioned a moment ago. They've been proposed for listing under the US Federal, I'm sorry, the US Endangered Species Act. They're already listed as threatened under COSWIC, that's the Canadian Species at Risk Act. And they're endangered, threatened, vulnerable, or have some level of concern in just about every US state and Canadian province in which they're found. And in point of fact, in Maine, not only are they a species of special concern, this is a purported stronghold for that species, and they still have that status, but they're also currently listed as a priority one species of greatest conservation need in Maine's most recent wildlife action plan. All this is to say that there's a lot a conservation concern for this species and a lot of research interest for this species on top of that. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more context by introducing some other studies. So this was a, a fairly recent study published, actually very recent, just last year, looking at the Northeastern part of their range at the regional level, at the watershed level. And what these, what these authors found was that 58% of the potential habitat, or sorry, of the habitat um, of wood turtles is um, likely been degraded to the point that it's no longer suitable. And those are the areas pictured here that are in red, orange, those, those, war those warmer tones. But notice that Maine and the far Northeast, actually we have quite a bit of high quality habitat remaining. There's another study that was published just a few years ago that's also very, very telling. And what these authors did was using a geographic information systems-based approach, that is a GIS-based approach to create what's called an ecological niche model to map the potential distribution of the species. And that's what's pictured here on the far left. And you can see that, sure enough, it lines up with where the species ought to occur. And in those areas that are more impaired, we tend not to find that animal because the habitat there is no longer suitable. That's the area in that red brown color and the areas that's blue and green up in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Northern New York is suitable habitat and still has a fair amount of highly suitable habitat. What these, what these authors then did was really interesting and important. They used different climate change scenarios to model what the future of wood turtle habitat would look like. And they used two different scenarios, a more lax version and a stricter, more conservative version under different climate change scenarios. They both tell a very similar story. Those two models are pictured um, on, the, uh, on the right side. <clears throat> and what we see here, is that in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, upstate New York, we maintain a stronghold, potential climate refugia moving forward. And that over the next 
um, 50 years, we're going to lose a large amount of the habitat outside of these stronghold areas. So there is something important and valuable about the habitat found in Maine. It will likely be a climate refugia in decades to come. So enter the Maine Wood Turtle Project. So um, my collaborators and I started the Maine Wood Turtle Project about seven years ago. And we did this to fill knowledge gaps in wood turtle biology and conservation and to share that information with important stakeholders, really mostly other academic biologists, state biologists, some now at nonprofits, our network is growing, and people that are responsible for the conservation and management of this species. So that was goal number one, right? Work with our peers, work with the professionals. Goal number two was to, was to train the next generation of conservation professionals. So we've had numerous field techs and crew leaders, crew members, students. We had honors thesis at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level uh, work on this project to promote wood turtle research and conservation while gaining important field skills, lab skills, learning how to interact with landowners and other members of the public and other stakeholders in writing grants, doing data management analysis, and presenting their results at professional conferences and elsewhere. So the Wood Turtle Project has really grown and now encompasses many different types of conservation. <clears throat> so what is the Wood Turtle Project? So I've been talking about it, but, but what exactly do we do? Well, there are five studies that fall under the umbrella of the main Wood Turtle Project, and they are population, demography, and viability. There's a lot of big words here. We're going to get to that momentarily. We're going to walk through these one by one. The next one is habitat selection, home ranges, and movement patterns, nest site selection, and nest fate combating the illegal wildlife trade, and then lastly, the use of conservation scent detection dogs. So let's walk through these projects and I'll tell you a little bit about each. So with respect to the first one, population demography and viability. Population demography in turtle populations is much like it is in human populations. It's really assessing the population density, age structure, and sex ratio that you find in natural populations. And these are all important because these are, these are parameters that you can input to a model to tell you about the stability and the health of your population. Ultimately, you can also use these, um, use these demographic characteristics to create what's known as a population viability analysis to determine if the trend of your population is stable through time, if it's declining through time, in which case you should worry, or if it's actually increasing through time. So how do we collect these population demographic characteristics? Well, we use a method called capture, mark, recapture. And it's just what it sounds. We, we walk through the streams and you can see in the lower right here, two crew members walking through a stream, not a, not a bad day at the office, <laughs> right? And their, their goal is to find as many turtles as they can. And every time we find a turtle, if it's a new turtle, we mark it, we collect all this other data and then we release it. If it's a turtle that we've captured before, we make a note of what its unique notch code was. We record that information and then collect a lot of data and then let it go. And we can then visit those sites again and again and hopefully capture more and more of the same animals. We always find new ones. And the more times we visit and the more years we do this, the better our estimates are when we input it into the model to estimate those population demographic characteristics. So we walk through the streams, we find turtle, then we process them like the two crew members pictured here um, on the left. And we collect a lot of information about them. So when we have a turtle in hand, the first thing we have to do is to identify it, of course, but wood turtles fortunately are unique and beautiful. It's easy to identify a wood turtle. The next thing we have to do is figure out if it's a male or a female. So pictured on the left here, we have conveniently found at the same time, a female and a male. Um, I actually have shells right here that I can also demonstrate this. Um, it's kind of like when you bring a puppy home from the shelter, you want to know if it's a boy or a girl, you just turn it over, right? So it's kind of like that, actually. So females actually have a flat plastron. So remember, carapace is on the top, plastron is the bottom part of the shell. If the shell is flat on the bottom and it's an adult, we know it's a female. Conversely, we know it's a male if it's slightly larger, but there's some overlap in size between the sexes. If it's concave like this, like a bowl on the plastron, we know it's a male. Um, and that's pretty straightforward, right? Because males will mount females during population. And if they're shaped like a bowl, they're less likely to fall off, <laughs> which, which is actually important because they, I mean, they can do it for like four hours. So they, they need the stability. So we, we weigh the animals, we measure the animals, right? We collect all of this important morphological information. We do health assessments. Um, and we also 
mark them uniquely using notch codes filed into those marginal scoots. So the scoots are the carotenized plates on top of the bony shell. All these scoots are unique and they have are unique to wood turtles. So all turtles have scoots, or I should say most turtles have scoots, um, but the position and the number is unique to a species. These scoots around the outside are called the marginal scoots. And we can file little V-shaped notches into them. And the position of those notches will uniquely identify that animal. So that's what this field crew member is doing here in the lower right, filing a unique notch code. And remember, this is carotenized tissue. It's kind of like clipping a, a fingernail. It doesn't actually hurt the turtle. There's no blood or anything. <clears throat> so this is just to demonstrate that. So we have a diagram, this is one right off of our data sheet. Um, and notice in those marginal scoots around the outside, I've numbered them. This is a pretty standard method. Each, each marginal scoot has a unique number. So if we were to file notches into the five marginal scoots, like on this young female right here, right? Notice we have the 7,000, the 200, the 20, the four, and the two scoots marked. Therefore, this animal is 7,000. 220 and four plus two is six. So that's that's this animal's number. So in all of our analyses, this is number 7226. Although, I mean, honestly, it's kind of boring, right? Number 226. So most of our turtles actually have a name as well. Incidentally, 7226 is young Charlie. She's, she's a feisty young gal. And, um, and we know a lot about her. And when she has a unique name like that, we can also remember information about her. And we're getting to know the, the, um, the inner lives of our turtles quite well. For example, two years ago, there was a flood on our river. Charlie got washed downstream about two kilometers and it took her a year to get back, wow. right? She's uniquely marked. So we now know all of this really interesting and potentially important information about her. <clears throat> we can do a lot of other things as well. And this is from a paper that uh, was just accepted and we'll, we'll have um, that will be released in June. So we're pretty excited about this. And it's all about population demography and viability of our um, central main population of wood turtles. And what we found using modeling, um, using capture mark recapture data was that our annual survival across our entire population is 90.5%. For females, it's approaching 95%. For males, 93%. Juveniles, it's much lower, which is why the average is 90%. And that's what's pictured right here on the plot. This is from our, our upcoming paper. And the gray is the 95% confidence interval. That black line is the average. So just keep a look at the, keep an eye on that black line. And you'll see as the animals get bigger, so as the carapace gets larger and larger, carapace length is on the horizontal axis, you see that the probability of survival goes up and it tapers off right around 180 millimeters or so. Coincidentally, 180 millimeters is the size at which the average turtle reaches sexual maturity and becomes an adult. So adult turtles have a much higher survival than juveniles. So again, we were able to do a population viability analysis, the other side of that, that, um, uh, that demography and stability coin. And according to our population or baseline population viability ana analysis, our lambda was 0.93. So what, what does that mean to a non-ecologist? Well, a lambda is a measure of growth rate. And if lambda is equal to one, it means your population is perfectly stable. If lambda is greater than one, it means your population is going up. And if lambda is less than one, it means your population is declining. So here we have one uh, lambda that's less than one. It means our population is declining, not terribly quickly. It's not going to crash overnight, but it does suggest that the population is declining. So what this tells us, if we were to take the, the um, or to, to, to um, I put this in a management perspective, what this tells us is that, well, our our adult survival is already very high. I mean, 95, 93%. So we're reaching a cap there. So if we really want to save this population, and by extension, save other populations with similar demographic parameters, then we want to increase the younger life stages, the nesting, the nest, um, or the nest survival, the hatchlings, the juveniles. Right. So we can learn a lot from these demographic analyses. So that was population uh, demography and viability. Let's now talk about the second study. This is habitat selection, home ranges, and movement patterns. Um, so that was all about like the, the demographics, right? Now we want to learn something about the habitat in which they live, because of course that's essential for proper conservation and management measures. When we say habitat selection, what we really mean is habitat use versus habitat availability. 
So what is available for the habitat to you? Uh, what is available for the turtle out there? And what habitats are they actually using within that available habitat? And we can look at this from a macro scale, sort of landscape level. So this is a satellite image in the middle. This is actually from a, a nearby area in central Maine. And we can look at the mosaic of landscape types, so forests, agricultural areas, there might be extraction pits and roads, and who knows, maybe there's a horse farm or something nearby. And we can learn about how the turtles navigate this environment and where they choose to spend time, where they're able to survive in this, this mosaic environment. So we can look at it at the macro or the broad scale. We can also look at it at the micro scale, sort of meter by meter. Why is a turtle choosing to live here or spend time here and not over here? Is it food related? Is it thermal regulation related? So does it need a certain amount of basking space or sunlight? Primary, our primary way of addressing these habitat questions is using radio telemetry. So radio telemetry um, involves putting a transmitter on a turtle. And so that's what's pictured um, here in the lower left. This is actually another male and female. I'm gonna pick up this animal right here again. This is a radio transmitter. Um, and this will uh, emit a signal, it can't hear it, you need a receiver to pick it up. Um, and we can use that to track the animal and find that animal no matter where it's located. So no matter how hard it might try to avoid us, we can actually find it, which they're not happy about. <laughs> um, so that's what I'm doing right here. I just found this turtle, I tracked it using the, the receiver right there. You can see it's a, it's a happy day. It always is when you get to hold a turtle in a river. <clears throat> um, and then when we find that animal, of course, we collect all kinds of information, like I discussed before, the morphological data for the population demography study, but, but also for the microhabitat study. So we have a GPS unit there to get, um, uh, to get that macro level right, coordinates of where that animal is. But then we also take temperature and humidity and a whole suite of other vegetation, um, uh, herbaceous vegetation, canopy cover, all of this other uh, data to learn about the microhabitats that these, that these turtles uh, live in. When we track turtles like this and we, we happen upon them, when we find them, we get other insights into the lives of turtles as well. So we often find turtles that have maybe some slug or snail or something on their face, like they've been eating, or sometimes berries are staining their beaks, or sometimes you catch them in moments when they really don't want to be caught, like this pair over here underwater. Right? But we learn a lot about the, the inner lives, the inner workings of, of turtles' lives um, when we're out there in the river observing them and therefore learning a lot about. Uh, about the habitats that they require. Now, I said that we can track a turtle and they can't hide from us, and that's not strictly true because with the radio receiver and a tag turtle, we can get it down, their position down to about a square meter or two. And you think, wow, a, a turtle with bright orange colors, clearly they stand out like a sore thumb in the environment, but that's not true at all. They can be extraordinarily cryptic. So oftentimes we're, we're faced with images like this, and by now you've probably seen the animal there. It's sort of just off center down a little bit. And you can see the transmitter and the back end of the shell and the wire coming from the transmitter. This one's relatively easy to find. Sometimes they're a little bit harder and, and they can be obscured underneath the, the dead vegetation, the leaves and the grass. They, they do like to hunker down. Sometimes they're, they're even harder yet. And you can be staring at them and not even know you're looking at them. And you know you're almost on top of them because the receiver tells you so. And yet it's almost impossible to find it, but this one is right in the middle of the picture underneath that branch, right? And then sometimes they're obscured even more. Um, and so sometimes like this one that really threw us for a loop actually burrowed in the mud and you can see he entered up there in the, on the upper right, circled all the way around and is parked um, towards the center right. And you can barely see the transmitter. You can barely see the wire. You really can't see the carapace, the top part of that shell at all, right? So sometimes it takes us, and I'm embarrassed to say, like 10 minutes to find a turtle we know is right there, <laughs> probably looking at us and smirking. <laughs> so the next study that I want to tell you about is the nest site selection and nest fate. So I mentioned in the demography study that we really can't improve adult survivorship very much because our adult survivorship is already quite high. So if we want to do something to rescue this population, and by extension, other populations, we need to focus on those early life stages, so the, the nests, the hatchlings, the juveniles. So a few years ago, recognizing that this was probably the case, we started the nest set excuse me, nest success and nest predation study to get a, a handle on 
on what nest fate was like. And we didn't know at this point. We only know from the literature that a high proportion of turtles often succumb to predators or other causes of nest failure. So our approach to this was to find likely nesting spots like beaches and that sort of thing where, where wood turtles nest and to use time-lapsed trail cameras. These are game cameras that you can buy at like Cabela's or, or Bass Pro. Some of them are a little more high tech. <clears throat> and we have fixed these facing the nesting areas and they are set to take pictures every two minutes, right? Rain or shine, day or night. And so this generates a lot of images which is great when we have students to look at all of those images. <laughs> um, so pictured here on the right is Trina Wattman. She's a, a graduate student in my lab. She's also a long time a crew member on the project and has um, liked it so much, she's come back to work on her, her graduate uh, degree um, on wood turtles. And she's taken over the nesting study for us uh, to, um, to man those cameras, women those cameras basically. <laughs> And we get a lot of pictures like this. And when we get pictures like this, we are like super excited, right? Because it's a female right in the right in the middle of the image, clearly nesting, right? Great information. So now we know where a nest is. Normally, if we didn't get it on camera, it's almost impossible to find a nest unless it's hatched, or more commonly, it's predated and there's eggshells scattered across the ground, in which case it's too late. So when we see images like this, that's good. We know we can do something. Um, unfortunately, we also get a lot of images that look like this, right? And skunks are major uh, turtle nest predators, and they will dig them up and they will destroy an entire nest very, very quickly. So we have a lot of pictures that, that look like this. Um, in fact, skunks are the number one predator of our nests. And in fact, in our most productive location, we think it might even be a single skunk coming back again and again. And in point of fact, 90% of our nests die almost entirely from predators, mostly from skunks, but not every time. And so sometimes we get lucky and at the end of the season when we're excavating nests, which we do to confirm nest fate, we, we do it after hashlings are supposed to emerge um, in the, the mid fall, um, but sometimes, here's Trina, right? Sometimes we actually get to rescue them. So these two youngsters would not have made it out of the nest without us. There's too many roots. It was too late in the season. Uh, their fate had been sealed, except we excavated and were able to rescue them. We took them down to the Center for Wildlife in South Maine, um, where they rehabilitated them. And the following year, we released them alive and well on our study site. So I wanted to give you a taste of what it's like to be a technician on the project. Most of the time you're out, out collecting data in the field and it's great. But a lot of the time in the evenings when it's raining out, we can't do field work, right? We have to go through those, those camera trap images that I mentioned before. And we quite literally get hundreds of thousands of images. And so it's students at a computer clicking the arrow key, you know, <laughs> looking at image after image after image, because really what you're looking for is kind, you know, it's kind of like those those cartoons from the Sunday funnies, and you have to identify the difference between them. It's like, oh, the lady's wearing an earring in this one, but not this one, right? It's kind of like that. And so you're faced with thousands of images that may or may not be useful. And then you see something like these two and you get all excited because jumping out at you is something interesting, right? To a trained eye, it takes a little while. You see that, yeah, in point of fact, there's a female coming up to nest right there. Um, so it's a lot of work. It's very time consuming, but it's rewarding and it pays off because we get to identify nests. <clears throat> so um, the next study that, that I, I want to tell you about um, is actually two studies. So a couple of years ago, um, we, we expanded to look beyond just ecology, right? Um, which is, and field studies, which is what we've been focusing on. And we decided to take the project into a slightly different direction. This was in recognizing that one of the main threats to wood turtles, like many other species of turtles, is overcollection for the pet trade. It's a huge problem. It's a global problem. It's a growing problem. In fact, wild, illegal wildlife trafficking is fifth internationally for the most lucrative illegal endeavors. It's right up there with drug trafficking and human trafficking. So it's a sad, scary state of affairs. So we decided that it would be an important contribution from our project if we could contribute tools to 
aid conservation law enforcement professionals in how to catch poachers, essentially. And this is especially true for wood turtles, but again, many other turtle species as well, because there have been a number of confiscation events in recent years, and those numbers are getting bigger per confisca confiscation event, and the number of events is getting larger per year. <clears throat> so we took two approaches with this. The first is an environmental DNA or eDNA approach called forensic DNA. So when a turtle is present in a space, be it in a river or in a container if somebody's transporting it, and then removed, the animal is no longer there to detect. You can't see it, but it leaves behind a trace of itself. If it defecated, if it shed skin cells, if anything happened, if it's a stream environment, maybe it's from mating or, or, or uh, sloughing skin, right? It leaves DNA behind, cells, tissue, and therefore DNA behind it. And so even if we can't detect the turtle directly through seeing it, we can nonetheless know that it was there if we could detect the turtle's DNA. This is the idea behind environmental DNA, which we're also piloting in the lab, but it's also the idea behind forensic DNA. So what my graduate student, Greg LeClaire, different graduate student Katrina is working on, is developing forensic DNA techniques. So he's put turtles into controlled conditions, these are ambassador, captive ambassador animals and rehabilitation facilities, into containers, just like pictured here, it's in a plastic bucket here, but this turtle is also placed into, um, uh, it's basically a pillowcase to test different materials. And then he removes the animal and we swab the material with just this really overpriced cotton swab here in the middle. And so what we're looking for is whether we can detect the presence of that turtle in the absence of that turtle by finding its DNA. Um, so the project is, is still ongoing, but I, I will say, and I don't have the results up here to present, that it's highly encouraging so far. The other sort of missing piece out of this is, well, not only can we detect the DNA, but how long, for, for how long can you detect the DNA? And so we're sampling it one day, one week, six months, right? Or I think one, one month and six months with the idea that there might, the DNA might eventually break down. So how long of a wait and you have before that DNA is no longer detectable. And again, preliminary results only suggest that that number is actually six months or more. Not good news for poachers. The other um, conservation law enforcement tool that we're developing uses stable isotopes and trace elements. So these are chemical signatures, profiles, if you will, found in the carotenized tissue it is like the fingernails of the scoots and the claws of the animals in the carotenized tissue a, that is reflective of the diet or the environment in which that animal has been raised or has lived at least for some time. And this is work that, um, that we're doing directly with CWS. In fact, Dr. Hopkins um, is um, our primary stable isotope and chemical, um, you know, chemical analysis. So, what we do is essentially clip the toenails. Again, it's just a little bit, one to two millimeters is all we need. It doesn't break the quick, it doesn't cause bleeding. It's like clipping your own fingernails. And we can analyze that toenail sample for its chemical signature, stable isotope ratio, and its trace element uh, profile. And with that data, we're able to determine whether that animal was raised legally in captivity or captured illegally from the wild. So if a conservation law enforcement, enforcement professional, maybe a game warden or a border, border patrol agent, caught somebody smuggling turtles, which happens all too frequently, unfortunately, that turtle may be laundered. It may be illegally identified as being um, legally captive bred. And it's very hard to prove otherwise. The burden of proof is on conservation law enforcement professionals, which is a hard thing to do. But if by simply clipping a nail, we could identify whether that turtle was actually legal or illegal, we would be able to prosecute far more offenders. So we wanna be able to generalize this. So this is the only study that I've mentioned in the Wood Turtle Project, the only one that we currently have ongoing that uses other species. So that includes Blanding's turtles, which are pictured in the, uh, the lower uh, left here, and then also spotted turtles in the far right. And for this, we've developed a network of 30 different zoos, aquariums, rehabilitation facilities, government researchers, and academic researchers from throughout the wood turtle, landing turtle, and spotted turtle ranges to amass a variety 
of nail types with different chemical profiles, both captive and wild environments. So it's been a large endeavor. Um, we actually just published our first paper last year on this, which we're very excited about. Um, and so far, our model is 97% accurate. Um, and I was just chatting with Jack over dinner tonight, and, and it looks like we could get that number to 100% very soon. So again, our goal is to make sure that uh, their poachers don't stand a chance, um, which we're pretty excited about. <clears throat> The last study that I want to tell you about is it's a little bit different. It's a it is a study where we're producing interesting results that will be valuable for other for other academic researchers and, and other conservation practitioners. Um, but it has the added benefit of helping out on a lot of our other studies as well. So we partnered with Science Dogs of New England, um, which is a small business located in Ellsworth, and it's operated by uh, by Lindsay Ware, who's pictured here. And Lindsay trained a, a conservation scent detection dog for us. That's Chili Bean right here, a black lab. So Chili is fully trained on finding wood turtles in the wild. You may have heard her talk and my colleague Cheryl Frederick's talk was actually here in the audience. Uh, they spoke as part of the Wild Main series last fall on specifically this, this topic. So Chile is, is, um, is trained on finding wood turtles. And so with Chile's help, we find even more wood turtles um, every season, which again, the more wood turtles we find, the more refined our population demographic estimates are and the better our models are, right? So she really does benefit a lot of our studies. We're also taking this to the next step by looking at other study areas and importantly, by looking at other uh, life history stages. Namely, we want Chile to find turtle nests for us, which is notoriously difficult. Um, and so far, the indicators are good, but the training is still in progress for that particular piece. So I want to give you just a, a brief um, sort of, or idea of what, of what this looks like. So this is Lindsay and, and Chile Bean right there. Um, so this is in the summer when the turtle's in the upland habitat away from the river. Most surveying has historically or traditionally been done on rivers when the turtles are concentrated and out in the open basking when they emerge or return to the river in the spring and fall. In the summer months, it's almost like they disappear because it's very hard to find them. And you can see why it's so overgrown, right? This is a, a typical main sort of riparian area. It's very hard, almost impossible for humans to find turtles in that environment, but not so if you have a nose like children. It's Lindsay, how does she know what you want her to do? Tug means that she got it right, and there's a turtle right there, and then she plays tug as a reward uh, for, <laughs> for doing her job, and, and she loves it. Um, whenever Chili Bean comes out with us in the field, it's clear that like we just make her day. <laughs> she gets to find her. <laughs> Um, oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that, that almost wraps it up. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the, the many, many partners, collaborators, um, and funders for all of their hard work on this project. It really has made it, made it possible. And again, um, we're talking about dozens of different institutions and people um, and technicians um, over the years. Um, I especially want to thank um, Dr. Cheryl Frederick, who again is right here in the audience. She is the co-principal investigator of the project. So of course, none of this would be even remotely possible without Dr. Frederick. Um, and then of course, CWS, um, and Jack Hopkins in particular, for um, uh, the, the massive role that CWS has had in, uh, in making the Wood Turtle Project uh, possible. And again, there are a million other small players, uh, small but not insignificant players um, in this project as well. And then lastly, um, I really would be remiss if I didn't thank the turtles. And I had mentioned before that they were charismatic and smart, and I wasn't joking. And every now and then you can convince them to record their own data, um, which, is, which is always helpful. Um, so with that, I think I left lots of time for, yeah, totally. um, for questions, if, if there are any. You said that they, that they had an interest in history. And that they're intelligent. I mean, you just mentioned recording their own data. <laughs> but, then, <laughs> but then I was joking, though, just to be clear. <laughs> but because their histories are different, they cross 
um, territories with, I, I don't know that much about turtles, so I was interested in finding out a little more in the Turtle 101. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they do have a very interesting life history, and it's not entirely due to their migratory habits, but that is part of it. So they are one of the few species of turtles that migrate from aquatic to terrestrial uplands in a predictable seasonal way. Okay, but so what is their range like? You mentioned the one that was two miles downstream, knew she was in the wrong place and headed back, but it took her a year. So are they typically very concentrated in one area? Um, yeah, in terms of like home ranges yeah. for individuals. Okay. Yeah, so it's 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 interesting. We're analyzing these data literally right now. And quite a fact, we had a meeting this, mor this morning discussing exactly this home ranges and movement patterns. Um, it's, it's variable. So a typical home range size would be a couple of square kilometers. However, it appears that there are individuals that do have much, much larger home range sizes. And there are some individuals, and we term them wanderers, um, and these are animals that just up and leave. Um, what's interesting, and we actually just published a note on this last fall, we, we found the longest recorded dispersal event of any wood turtle yet published. And it's particularly interesting, and I'll just tell you this quick story because it is an interesting one. So we have an animal that we caught when we were venturing just outside of the edge of our study area. And we were like, well, we, were, we had an extra transmitter. We were in need of more males. So we went ahead and we tagged them. It turns out that he didn't move back towards our study site, which we were kind of hoping for at the time. He moved in the other direction. We caught him one more time that season. And then it's as if he fell off the map. And remember, he was radio tagged, so we could find him again if we were within a couple of kilometers. So he apparently like booked it rather quickly. <laughs> and we don't know where he was, and he disappeared for a whole year. Oh, wow. It was bizarre. And then, and I'll exaggerate a little bit, but the friend of a friend of a friend of a friend <laughs> like, called me out of the blue and said, hey, I know somebody who has a neighbor that took a picture of a turtle <laughs> with this thing on its back. Mm -hmm. It was a radio transmitter. And this turtle had ventured over 30 kilometers. <laughs> um, we, we visited, we didn't see it, but we got a signal. So we confirmed it was in the area. It was a little bit out of our walking range and our private property. So we let it be, but we knew it was there. What's even stranger is that the following summer, a similar thing happened. A friend of a friend of a friend of a friend reached out and said, hey, I have a picture of a neighbor that has a turtle in the yard with this thing on its back. It was, it was like deja vu all over again. And it turns out it was the same animal. And we were able to do that because the photos were good enough and the descriptions on it, they were quite clear with the transmitter glued to this pack. Um, it was the same animal and had continued to move another six kilometers. So it's really unusual, but these it animals- was I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, we have other males that wander, but no males that wander that. And their uh, lifespan is long. It's long. Yeah. So uh, up to 60 to 80 years. Yeah. So uh, a, a few individuals. <laughs> I'm going to be getting caught. If this happens next year, too, I really will be in awe. Yeah. It'll be New Brunswick, I think. Yeah. So really interesting uh, yeah, patterns. Yeah. I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, do you do anything in terms of trying to protect the nest when you find them from predators? And, and, and if you do, what, what do you do to successful? Yeah, so it, it's a really good question. It's a very fair question and one that we have debated many times amongst many times amongst the crew. And we seem to be naturally falling into two factions, those that want to protect the nests and those that don't. Sometimes I'm of the faction that don't want to protect them just yet, and I'll tell you why, but I often feel outnumbered. So <laughs> the purpose of our study was to identify population health and to figure out if it's not healthy, why isn't it healthy? Because whatever we discover here is going to be directly applicable to thousands of other populations that are declining throughout their range. So our goal wasn't necessarily to conserve this population. That is an ultimate goal, and that is important, certainly. But our more immediate goal was to spend some time, a few years, to figure out what their threats are. And we can't do that if we interfere in the first couple of seasons. So the short answer is we don't protect the nests, although that probably will be coming. We want to figure out what the problems are first 
What does the population health look like uh, first? I that part, but if you were to detect oh, that. If. Oh, um, we would use a predator exclusion device. A predator exclusion device? So there's a number of them that have been um, different types out there that have been developed for turtle nests. But essentially, it's a, it's a grate that you put over the nest, kind of like a chicken wire or something with holes big enough where the hatchlings could get out, but a predator can't dig up the nest. Um, and so there's, again, different versions out there, but they all have the effect of excluding predators, but allowing the young to emerge. Um, there are other options too. You could dig up the nest and relocate it. You could dig up the nest and head start them in captivity and release them when they're at a less vulnerable age. All of those have been used to various extents in, in different places with different levels of success. This person on, on Zoom has a similar question asking, can anything be done about preventing skunks from raiding the turtle nest? Well, the predator exclusion device yeah. will work for that. Um, and again, it's something we are actively considering. <clears throat> That would that would be the preferred choice. Yep. And predators are the main cause, but there are other causes of, of nest failure as well. So inundation by water during flood events um, is a big one. One that we've seen in our study site, it's our second leading cause of mortality at our study site, is root intrusion by our herbaceous vegetation where the roots will grow into the egg and entwine and, and kill the turtles. So we have some really gruesome images of turtles that were completely surrounded by roots and died that way. Yeah. You mentioned uh, turtle intelligence. What is an example of uh, intelligent turtle? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is actually a really interesting and almost amusing question. Or it should be the answer is the questions are really good about it. Um, so there was a paper published approximately a century ago that documented intelligence in wood turtles. And what this researcher had done, I'm not even sure if the researcher was a biologist, but it was an academic. Um, they took the turtle and they put it in a rat maze. So this is a maze designed for rats. And they put the wood turtles, this guy's basement, in the maze. And they had the wood turtle run the maze. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, yeah, we're, we're run, right? <laughs> slowly meandered through. Uh, but it turns out that, that the turtle could navigate the maze and remember the route that it took to find the exit, at least as well as rats, which are notoriously smart um, for, for rodents anyway. Um, it was a long time ago. I don't know, it wasn't terribly controlled. The sample size was one. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, Wood turtles do other interesting behaviors that are also indicative of intelligence. And I'll, I'll give you one example. They're one of the few species that are known to do what's called wood, uh, sorry, worm stomping. So you might be familiar with this, where a, an animal will go out into sort of an open area like a, with a lot of bare ground. And either in one of two ways, they'll either move their front feet like this and stomp on the ground, creating vibrations or they'll lift and raise their plaster on their whole shell, and the plaster on will hit the ground in a thumping way. And what they're doing is they're, they're tricking worms into moving from subterranean up to, um, up to air level, right above ground, so they can eat them. And these, these are omnivores. So it, not many species do that. Um, so that, that's pretty telling. Yeah. Can you explain again why the turtles are on the very top of the list of most endangered species for vertebrates? Yeah, so why turtles? So, um, big picture, turtles are facing the usual suspects, right? The same drivers towards extinction that other vertebrates, but all other species really. So, it's habitat loss and degradation. Um, it's collisions for turtles, it's collisions with automobiles and agricultural equipment. These are these are predictable and not unique to turtles. Um, what is slightly more unique to turtles, but are also found in, in other wildlife, um, like birds, for example, it's over collection for the pet trade. So turtles as a whole are, are entering the pet trade and food trades, depending on where you are in the world, um, at alarming rates. And as populations get lower, they become, the demand goes up. And so they face even uh, a faster spiral towards extinction. Yeah, those are the big drivers. And climate change, which we haven't really seen the impacts of climate change yet, at least we don't think we have, but 
as I showed from the climate modeling, right, the ecological niche model, um, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Do they, do these particular turtles uh, live with other species or are they more because they're further north? Are they like when they exist, are they the dominant ones? Oh, okay. So um, when they exist in like the same wetland as other turtle yeah. species? Uh, so there are, so as, as you might know, there's there's about eight or so native turtles in Maine. Yeah. Um, the turtles that live in this environment, so these are riverine riparian species, or eight riverine riparian species that lives in medium to large streams. There aren't many other species that live in those environments. So snapping turtles, probably Maine's most common turtle, is sometimes found in those environments. And we right. do get them on our study sites. They're not abundant, but we do see them pretty regularly. And every now and then we see the wayward painted turtle. Painted yeah. turtles like still water, um, ponds and sloughs and oxbows. And sometimes they, they come in from those environments. And we do occasionally find them in and around our study sites. In terms of the dominance question, that's a really interesting one. And that's one that is not documented in the literature. Very few people are reporting on wood turtle behavior in, in general, which is unfortunate in the gap that we're interested in filling. Um, our, our preliminary evidence is somewhat anecdotal at this point, but we're actively gathering more, is that there is an influence of snapping turtles nearby. And we see that mostly on nesting beaches because they share the same type of nest requirements or nest habitat requirements. Um, and the snapping turtles are much bigger. And honestly, if you've ever met a snapping turtle, you know how ornery they are. <laughs> um, and uh, they're, they're large and they, um, they, they do tend to um, outcompete, if you will, the turtles. I had a circumstance, and I have no idea what kind of turtle it was, but I was driving from on Route 46 from Route 1 to Route 9. And as I was driving along, there was sort of a, a bridge, and crossing the road was a fairly sizable turtle, but he was right in the middle of the road. So I stopped the car, <laughs> the car behind me around me, uh -huh. and I went over to him and I looked down at uh, this turtle, and I looked down at it. And I went, I've got to get this out of the road. And then I looked at the size book, and I looked down and I thought, oh, I wonder if this is the snap. <laughs> so I went down to reach for it, and this thing looked at me over its, its shell, and it just like screamed. <laughs> I walked behind it, and I broke down to the street, and I just, I still don't know what it was, but. I wasn't sure how to pick up a turtle. <laughs> yeah, and so it, it, it's a good question. So I, wood turtles are docile. I mean, they, they will bite, but it's very, very Well, he rare. didn't look like he was good. I mean, when I reached for him, but I was thinking if he didn't move, they couldn't, I mean, if he was going to take turtle speed across the road, he <laughs> might not be good. So I was like, you know, should I grab this thing? Um, and, and so you, you're, you're right to do that. So the, the rule of thumb is if you see a turtle in the road and it's safe to stop and pull over, you should move the turtle to the side that it was heading towards. Yeah. Right. So that's that's and you just grab your by the back of the shell. Yeah. So for a wood turtle, it's, it's easy. You just pick them up on the sides or paint a turtle. Um, if it's a snapping turtle, you do want to be more careful. So if it couldn't withdraw its head entirely into a shell, its shell, it would be a snapping turtle. Um, and their heads really are big, and their necks are much longer proportionally than the other species, and they're much more apt to bite. Um, so for snapping turtles, you can pick them up, but you want to pick them up from the back most part like this. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. If you pick them up here, it it will bite you almost certainly. Um, you can pick them up like this, but getting your hands in these <laughs> positions can be a little bit tricky, and typically we reserve that for herpetologists. <laughs> <laughs> Graduate students. <laughs> yeah. Well, one more. Uh, is sex determined by temperature and weakness? No, no. So this is one of those fairly unusual turtles where temperature, I'm, I'm sorry, where uh, sex determination is genetic. Uh, so she's asking about sex determination, which is how do you, how did, how is the animal determined whether it's a male or a female for most species, but by no means all, by most species of turtles, it's temperature dependent. So it's the incubation temperature at a key sort of pivotal point um, during nest development or embryo development in the eggs. Um, for, for this species and a handful of others, it's genetic. 
I get it from people and post other birthdays. Yeah. Is there thoughts of how to get out to like places like Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia? And was that before the when the land was connected or what? Um yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose it could be. They could also have been transported by Native Americans. Um, so this species <clears throat> using shell middens and sort of historical records, um, we, we know that they were used by Native Americans. So it, it could be that they were put there by people. Um, it's also possible that they would make it out on like, floating debris during a storm event. So, I know, lots of other species will, will move that way. Um, I don't know. I mean, the species it doesn't move very quickly, and of course, when, during the last glacial maximum, maximum, they were much further south, and they, they sort of moved north incrementally. But they haven't been in Maine all that long, right? We're talking about maybe five thousand years, not tens of thousands of years. Yeah, I don't know. We have some questions on from our Zoom audience. Sure. Um, this person asks, turtles are hard to see in uplands or brush. What happens if an ordinary hiker steps on one? <laughs> or maybe how do you avoid stepping on one? Yeah. Um, so for wood turtles in particular, they, they tend to hunker down off trail. So chances are, if you stick to the trails, um, you won't step on one. Um, if you do step on one, if it's a mature adult, it will probably be fine. Their shells are quite durable. Um, not that you should go around stepping on turtles, um, but but it would probably be fine. Um, yeah, I mean, they they have a vested interest in not being seen. So there's not a whole lot that, mm -hmm. that you can do other than just watch where you step and <laughs> stick to the trail. Mm -hmm. Someone else is wondering if there are issues with high predation rates from raccoons, otters, and minks on juvenile or adult wood turtles at yeah. any of your sites? Uh, so of the mortality um, that we've seen amongst sort of older juvenile, sub-adults, and adults, um, predation does seem to be the biggest cause. We, we also, um, as opposed to flooding and other events like that, which we do see that as well, we don't have a lot of mortality of adults um, in keeping with that, that graph that they saw where adults <laughs> And some adults have a high survival. Um, the, the biggest predators that are, I should also say that uh, wood turtles often lose limbs, right, from predators and also from, from human traps like muskrat traps and that sort of thing. But, but usually it's from, it's naturally from predators and predators will, will chew off limbs or other parts like tails that they can access. Um, but they, the turtles for the most part seem to do okay. We've even seen double amputees in the field and they're healed over and apparently surviving. Um, I doubt if they could survive with three limbs missing, but they seem to be able to at least some of the time with two limbs missing. So that's, that's predation as well. The chief predators that we see on our study site and that we believe are important would be otters. We see a lot of signs of otters um, and we do see a fair number of mink and some mink sign as well. So they absolutely could take a young individual as well, juvenile. We have raccoons. Um, interestingly, we have very little evidence that raccoons are impacting the population. They, they might be, and we just haven't detected that yet. We don't have, as far as we know, terribly high raccoon abundance, but we do see them. Um, it was also interesting is that raccoons are known nest predators, which we're very concerned about, but we have no evidence that a raccoon from any of our trail camera images, no evidence that a raccoon has actually predated a wood turtle nest on our study site, which is not true in other parts of their range. In fact, we even have some camera footage of a raccoon walking across a known nest and not digging it up. It's just wandering by, apparently. Um, someone else is wondering if invasive species impact nesting sites, whether plants or animals. Yeah, so the, the short answer is absolutely. Um, so we're fortunate not to have huge problems with invasive species, but other places certainly do. And eradication programs are important. Some of the, the, the big players would be like canary weed grass and Japanese knotweed. These are species that grow in uh, riparian areas that might also be important for nesting. And when they take over, um, the, the roots and the lack of open space available for nesting uh, becomes a big problem. Um, and they do require management in those situations. Yeah. Yeah, and someone says specifically, 
Large colonies of Japanese knotweed occupy formerly diverse riparian habitats in some sites. Any suggestions for guidance in post-depression habitat restoration benefiting wood turtles? Uh, get rid of the knotweed. <laughs> close to water, don't use herbicide um, unless you can help it. Knotweed, the only, uh, the most effective way of, of destroying knotweed is to cut it down, that I've heard of anyway, maybe this is, is not strictly true everywhere, but is to cut it down and put something over it, like heavy rubber matting or weight down cardboard or something, and leave it there for years if you can. Um, if it's a high flood area, that can be difficult. Um, but, but suffocating it, keeping the light out is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone else asked, can citizens help the project, the wood turtle project, in any way if they should come across a wood turtle? Um, if you come across a wood turtle um, in Maine, uh, the state has a program called MARAP. It's the Maine, no, it's the, why am I going to <laughs> reptile and amphibian? Maine Atlas, the Maine Amphibian Maine and Reptile, reptile Atlas, Atlas Project. Project. <laughs> <laughs> they always just call it MARAP. Yeah. Um, and so you can fill out a MARAP form, um, which is easily downloadable. I think you can sit, submit this all online now as of just last year or so. Uh, but Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is the keeper of the MARAP data. Not every state, but most states have a similar program. So if you see an unusual animal, if you see a usual animal in an unusual place, maybe a county towards the um, uh, like far north, it's not as populated and you think that record might be of interest, you can create a mare wrap record. If you can take a picture of the animal, it's just that much more believable and that will <laughs> um, go into the database of, of reptile and amphibian sightings in the state. Um, and it is valuable data. It's being used right now to compile the next edition of the amphibians and reptiles of Maine book. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is used and it's important. What I don't recommend is that you post anything on social media um, with your find if it's a wood turtle. So remember, this is a this is a, a, a heavily poached species. And so we don't want to tell potential poachers where you may have found that information. Photographs nowadays often have geotags associated with them automatically. So if you post that picture on social media, it just takes one tech savvy person to find out where that picture was taken, even if you didn't state it explicitly. So it's best um, take a picture, submit it with Mayor App. Don't share it with anybody else. Maybe just tell somebody about your cool finding later. But be yeah. ambiguous with where you found it. That was one of my thoughts. If you put cages around the nests, it's like if a poacher came along, they would know exactly where they're, all they'd have to do is wait for them to have. That, that is true. Yeah. Um, fortunately, our sites anyway are quite rural and, and wood turtles tend not to do very well around a lot of human development. So a lot of these populations are still quite rural. Yeah. If poaching for the pet trade is a problem, is there has there been any effort to outlaw the stale of certain wild species? Uh, yes, there has been a lot of movement. Not so much yet from Maine, but other states are really cracking down on the harvesting of their turtles, uh, the legal harvesting uh, even. So I, I want to say it's Minnesota, Wisconsin recently passed a law with further restrictions. South Carolina, which used to have very lax laws, have recently become much more strict. Florida, the same thing. Texas, the same thing. I want to say Louisiana, Louisiana and or Mississippi, the same thing. So states are cracking down on the on the legal turtle trade to limit the, the number taken from the wild. As people were harvesting more uh, to use domestically, but also to ship overseas, um, the need has become more poignant. The states are starting to take action. Do they ship like northern wood turtles overseas? They do. A number have, have turned up in China and Hong Kong and other Asian countries where there's a strong market for it, as well as other US states. But yeah. that's illegal, right? <laughs> yes, yes, that is illegal. Um, they, they, they are, they can be legally captive bred. You can buy a legal wood turtle. You can't actually keep the wood turtle in many states, but you can legally buy them in some places. Um, hence the, the need for the conservation law enforcement tool we're working on. I mean, how, how much do they work? They must be worth. Um, they, they absolutely are, and the price is going up. It depends on the condition, the color, the pattern, the size, the age. It depends on a lot of things, but it's 
Um, it's a lot. Wood turtles are not alone in this. So we're facing similar problems with the relatives of the wood turtle. And we have a number here in Maine, like spotted turtles and landings turtles and frog turtles. And um, it's happening worldwide that yeah, prices are going up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering um, when you find, unfortunately, road filled turtles in the springtime, you know, they're usually females looking for nesting sites. Yeah. Is there any thought about, is it effective at all to try to harvest those eggs and just put them in some sand by the roadside? Or um, does, are, are there data about that? Would it know, work? I've never seen a study where anybody's quantified the impact of restoring recovered eggs to populations. I know that some people do it. It's normally informally done, yeah. sometimes at rehabilitate or sometimes in people's homes. Um, but you wouldn't be able to give advice about like a place or a depth or no, I mean that would drop. that would be in the published literature. Um, the, the the temperature, the depth, the substrate. Hatching turtles is relatively easy. Mm -hmm. Um, well, unfortunately, I yeah. see that you know, I, when I cycle around in the springtime, you know, I, the turtles usually females. Sometimes you can even see the eggs. You know. Yeah, they're attracted to those road margins on the shoulders mm -hmm. that are gravel, and there's limited nesting habitat around. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt to just try to put some eggs in there. <laughs> yeah, you could. And you could just relocate them someplace else and bury them in a sandy area. Uh, we have one more question on Zoom here. Sure. Um, do does the wood turtle habitat include freshwater streams that lead to tidal zones? Um, so freshwater, yes, it's not known in brackish or saltwater systems. So freshwater systems, yes, mm -hmm. um, throughout their the coastal range or where the species is the coast. Yeah, it could be there. Oh, one more. Do you know if wood turtles eat jumping worms? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I bet they would if they could catch them. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they, they are omnivores. They'll, they'll eat pretty much everything they can find or catch with few exceptions. So we've seen them eating like green vegetation, like dandelion leaves and other types of leaves. We've seen them eating, uh, we even saw one with like leopard frog remains on it. Could have been scavenging it. Um, but certainly slugs and snails and fruits and berries of various kinds. Um, they have a pretty wide diet. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, Jack. Thank you to the Center for Wildlife Studies. That was fascinating. I learned a lot. Um, and we look forward to continuing the Wild Main series with the next program. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you for joining us.